Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, at this virtual event, our Silver Sea Expeditions Uncovered with Monday Adventures. Um, my name is Alex Loizu. I am the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Monday Adventures, and it's my pleasure today to be joined by Donatella from Silver Sea, but most importantly, excuse me, Donatella, Daniil from Silver Sea, who's going to be our presenter today, and we'll be able to give you a little bit more information about Silver Sea's fantastic expedition cruise program. Um, just before he does, and just before I hand over, a little bit of housekeeping. If you are watching on an iPad, tablet, or mobile device, please tap your screen now, and then you will be able to hear. That message will appear in this chat box on the screen shortly. So those of you who can't hear know what to do. And may I just also add that for anybody who has any questions throughout the presentation, uh, the chat pod is available to you. Uh, Donatello and I will be around to answer those questions. And uh, any questions that are slightly more involved, we can talk about at the end as well. So to give you a little introduction to Monday Adventures. Uh, Monday Adventures is the, uh, the, the adventurous younger brother of Monday Cruising, which is our main, uh, our main brand here um, at, at Monday. We've been in business for over 50 years. And actually, as Silver Sea launched their Expedition Cruise program, we launched Monday Adventures for those people that were looking to go to incredible places that could really only be reached by water. Um, and what we do is we specialize on uh, small ship cruises and we specialize on giving the very best advice to our clients who are looking to travel. Uh, we talk about which ships to use, which ships to go on, which room grades might be most appropriate, and we can help with any extended pre and post cruise programs. So what we're here to do is make your make make the booking of your journey as easy, stress free, and seamless as possible. And what Silver Sea do fantastically well is deliver an unmatched expedition experience. And to find out a little bit more about that, um, I'll hand over to Daniil now. So just to say, Donatella and I are going to disappear from view now, so we don't interrupt the presentation, um, but we will reappear again at the end uh, in order to answer any of your questions. So thank you very much for your time for me. And Daniil, over to you. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Donatella. Thank you so much for invitation. It's been a while since um, that was uh, since last time I worked with our UK sales team and with um, Mundi. It's been about five, six years at least. Um, please let me introduce myself first. My name is Daniel Elterman. Um, here at Silver Sea Expeditions, I'm Senior Director of Operations and uh, Expedition Field Staff. I have been with the company for 15 years uh, since day one of Silver Sea Expeditions. And uh, over the last 15 years, um, been traveling through pretty much all the destinations that we cover. Um, as well as through multiple roles within the company. For the first seven years, um, I was one of expedition staff members and spent most of my year uh, on board our expedition vessels, either in Arctic and Antarctica, uh, South Pacific, whenever the life would take me. And for the last seven going on eight years, I, I'm office based uh, right now here in Miami, Florida, nice and warm, the beautiful morning as usually it is in Florida. And my job in the company is to oversee our operations, um, gear, equipment, permits for expedition staff, um, as well as recruitment, scheduling of expedition staff and the training and development. So it's quite a lot uh, to take in, but I have a wonderful people working with me through professionals. And um, today I will introduce you to some polar regions, uh, Arctic and Antarctica, as well as we'll touch on Galapagos. Um, our time is not unlimited, unfortunately. There's, these are uh, quite big regions to cover, a lot of information, but I will do my best to share some knowledge, some insight from insider, from someone who has been in the field and worked in the field through all these seasons, uh, through all itineraries, and hopefully I will help you to make some choices with regards to your uh, future travel. But first of all, um, I will start with Pillars of Silver Sea Expedition, what we believe in and what we're trying to achieve every single day, taking our guests in the remotest areas uh, on our planet. First of all, one of the main distinctions between classic cruising and expedition cruising, in my humble opinion, is educational uh, aspect. As you know, um, 
expedition vessels are generally smaller in size. Our largest take 270 guests only. Uh, that's Silver Wind I'm talking about. Um, most of them are purposefully built for expeditions to operate in icy areas, and some of them are refurbished um, to enable those operations. But um, besides taking you to these remote locations and allowing you to see wildlife in the wild, be that penguins or polar bears, uh, you name it, um, our job is to also explain you the region, make sure that you came back home with understanding, broad understanding of the region of the place where you have traveled. Therefore, on every single voyage, we'll have an expedition team, no matter where in the world, that consists of expedition leader, assistant expedition leader, and a whole lot of naturalists and lecturers. You always will have marine biologists, geologists, historian, ornithologist, sometimes anthropologist, uh, current affairs specialist. Uh, and, and when you're in the field, uh, on your uh, nature walks, on your zodiac cruises, or if you have a day at sea, half a day at sea, we make sure to use every opportunity to share knowledge of the destination about birds, plants, marine life, history of exp exploration, or more modern affairs. Activity, the second pillar is activity. No matter where we take you, we make sure at one of our goals that we keep you on board as little as possible and will take you ashore and to explore as much as possible. Remember, expedition vessels um, are quite limited with regards to entertainment. There is no casinos, there is no nightly shows. Of course, there is some live music um, in the evening. There are some cooking demonstration and culinary presentations, but and lectures, of course, uh, inf informative lectures, but we are not entertainment uh, program. So that we're educational program, therefore, Whenever we can, as much as we can, we try to take you ashore. When ashore, we cater or we aim at catering to various fitness levels uh, and offer various hikes, um, longer ones and steeper ones for more agile, um, medium strength for, let's say, our average clientele and for guests with a reduced mobility, which we also can accommodate we always make sure that there is someone ashore at the landing site to stay with them and interpret the nature that they see around. Scenery, no matter where you go, there is scenery. And the next slides will show quite amazing scenery in Arctic, Antarctica and Galapagos. Culture, um, not everywhere we go. Um, polar regions like Svalbard, for example, or Antarctica, this is not, these are not the destinations to go look for culture. There is some history but not the culture, not the culture, not so many cultural remains as such. But whenever we go to places like um, Greenland, Iceland, Northern Canada, we make sure to connect with the local communities, Inuit communities there or African communities when we operate along the west or east coast of African continent. And wildlife. Uh, one of the things that we would never do at Silver Sea Expeditions, we would never take you to a zoo to show you caged animals. This is this defines our vision completely and entirely. Our goal is to take you to the areas where you can see the wildlife in the wild, in their natural habitat. When all our staff are highly trained to make sure that we observe wildlife in such a way that we do not disturb them or uh, somehow alter their natural behavior. But let's start um, with um, one of the first des destinations, let's start with Arctic, right? And we go top to bottom. So let's start with Arctic. We just started Arctic season with Silver Endeavor, and I will show you a few images literally from last week. Um, but here, the, uh, our fleet, Silver Sea Fleet, first of all, uh, it's Silver Wind, Silver Explorer, Silver Endeavor, Silver Cloud, and Silver Origin. Uh, all this information you can find on the website as well if you want to look up our vessels in more distant, in more detail and look at the layout of the suites and rates and stuff like that. Because my job here is not to explain the suites and categories and pricing. I'm absolutely ignorant with regards to that. I'm a field person and I'm very much involved with operation, what's happening in a field, but what, not what's happening on a sales side. So uh, here are five vessels in the fleet at the moment. We will be losing Silver Explorer at the end of November. And moving forward into two, uh, going into 2024, 
we will have four vessels remaining in our fleet. Um, so let's start with Arctic. Um, Arctic is quite convenient destination for you, Brits, I believe, mostly to travel. It's quite close to home, closer than Antarctica, uh, closer than Galapagos, uh, very much within reach, literally within a day. You can be in Arctic and even above the Arctic Circle. But what defines Arctic? Arctic is, you see on the slide, is a circle, geographical circle, is everything that is north of 66.33 uh, degrees north, considered to be Arctic region. And we operate in pretty much the entire region, except for the last few years in Russian Arctic due to the events, the events that I don't need to explain you. Uh, we used to operate in Russian Arctic as well and do the famous Northeast Passage. We did Kamchatka, Chukotka, but that is put on hold. No one knows for how long and um, definitely not for uh, the next two years. That leaves us with Norway, Norwegian Arctic, and one of the regions that we focus highly is in Svalbard. And I will talk about Svalbard just now. Then we spend quite a bit of time uh, in Greenland and northern Canada as well, and we touch um, US Arctic, the Northern Territories and Alaska. So let's start with Svalbard. Um, Svalbard is the destination, and if you um, see the map, I hope you do, Svalbard is located right above Norway and still under, um, falls under Northern, Norway, and it is a Norwegian territory. Svalbard is a destination to go and look for wildlife. This is a not a cultural destination in um, any aspect. There are a few communities living there. The main one being Longyearbyen, very much scientific community. And it's a small town with a permanent uh, settlement that where people live year round, mostly work in research, a bit of hospitality. Um, place where we stop regularly. And that's, that's opportunity to visit the museum, to buy souvenirs. But that's really your only a little bit of cultural stop, right? And uh, on some voyages, it also will be embarkation or disembarkation port. The rest of the time, we navigate and go in from fjord to fjord along the southern and western side and northern side of uh, Svalbard and Spitsbergen in particular, looking for polar bears and other wildlife. So the main draw of Svalbard, of course, will be polar bears. Uh, for many people. Uh, it's fortunate and, and unfortunate at the same time. But, and as we go, I will try to explain you why I say fortunate and, and unfortunate. But beside that, this image that uh, you see in front of you, it's one of the better representation of what Svalbard Archipelago looks like. You see there's quite high mountains with the snow, snow cups, with the uh, glaciers, slowly sliding down. You see quite protected bay where one in one of the multiple fjords and bays. Um, you see guests working through relatively flat uh, tundra, uh, covered tundra vegetation covered terrain. Um, you see our guests walking in small groups with uh, one of the naturalists or lecturers that interpret the area that you see around. So this, this image probably one of the better images to in one slide to show the Svalbard. Although as we go along, you will see how diverse and different Svalbard can appear. So now let's start with the polar bears. Just to make it clear, just to clear the air, that just so there is no false expectations or no false promises. In the Arctic, um, Svalbard uh, is one of the best areas to see polar bears. Um, out of everything that we do, um, Norwegian Arctic, Greenland, Canadian Arctic, uh, well, Iceland is also partly falls under Arctic because it touches Arctic Circle. Um, Russian Far East is, uh, so Russian Arctic is out of question. So there is not so many destinations really remain where one can go and see polar bears in the wild, right? So Svalbard is one of the better options. Um, over the last 15 years of operations, I heard of two or three voyages when our guests did not see polar bears at all. 
Um, otherwise, we were lucky. And I will show you some images from literally last week. But at the same time, what is important to understand that visit to Swalbard and search for polar bear and other wildlife, it is a safari in, in, in a sense. The wildlife there is not stationary. Some of them more, some of them less. Polar bears very much moving around, looking for food all the time. They do not stay in one spot from day to day to day to day, unless there is a carcass of the dead whale or something like that that can last for a week, and then the polar bears can come and feed on that carcass and stay in the area. Otherwise, it is a constant search. So if you do want to see polar bears, Swalbard is a great destination to do that or to attempt to see polar bears, but please do not, uh, please do understand um, at no any stage we can guarantee that going to Swalbard you will see polar bears. And the variety of sites sighting varies. Sometimes you're very lucky, you can see polar bears, mothers and cubs and polar bears on like on this uh, image with a fresh kill. Uh, sometimes you will have a literally a glimpse somewhere in the distance through binoculars literally for a minute or two, and that may be your only sighting for the voyage, right? So planning your trip to Swalbard, considering Swalbard, um, do not fixate on polar bears because the less, the lower expectation, the less disappointment if you have a very distant uh, or brief sighting or maybe do not see them at all. But otherwise, you can see there is one of the attractions of Swalbard. Now, um, there's another beautiful shot of polar bears, and you'll see a couple of more. Walrus is easier to find. Uh, we do know a few, a few walrus hold out locations where they usually come and rest in between feeding. And I'm still not going to use the word guarantee, but to go to Swalbard and spend the voyage in Swalbard and not seeing walrus at all would be pretty difficult. As I said, they do have their whole out spots where they come and rest in between feeding. And of course, we plan our itinerary in such a way to make sure to include these whole outs. Absolutely amazing animals. Uh, and usually we do get to see them on land and in the water close to our zodiacs. Now, um, birds, amazing birds. It's a um, northern, northern Atlantic is a paradise for birders. Uh, this is Atlantic puffin, probably the bird that ignited my passion for birds. I'm actually a keen birder. I walk around even here in Miami. When I walk my dog, I have binoculars over my shoulders just to see if I uh, spot some new species occasionally. Um, but absolutely a lot of Arctic birds, a lot of pelagic birds um, that nesting on um, rocks, little islands uh, in Swalbard during the summer one of my favorite stops absolutely favorite stops and zodiac cruises are actually is actually on bear island um and i will show you exactly on a, where bear island is uh, on the map on the next slide but have a look at this image it's literally sheer cliffs absolutely packed packed with nesting birds uh, so your guillemots your brunic gully guillemots common guillemots there is a good chance to see puffins as well uh, a lot of kitty wakes the noise, the sound of tens of thousands of nesting birds is, birds is quite impressive, um, but also incredible geology, as you can see, it's very scenic. There are also quite a few caves and uh, narrow passages that we can go through admiring not only birds, but the scenery and the geology in general. So you see uh, on a, your left top corner, there is a small map with a bear island encircled in red. So it is pretty much in the middle between uh, Tromso, your departure port, uh, or your turnaround port, and the Longibern and the Swalbard Archipelago. So we always make sure to do the stop at Bear Island and offer incredible Zodiac cruise, weather permitting, when we travel between northern Norway and Tromso. And I will show you some um, voyages later that uh, include Bear Island, but one of the most amazing and stunning and breathtaking zodiac cruises um, right there in Bear Island. Now, uh, besides polar bears, walrus, birds, um, practically on every voyage we do see uh, reindeer. They're very popular, very, num very numerous. They're in Swalbard, Arctic fox as well. They are 
quite cool creatures. They usually patrol along the cliffs, uh, waiting for uh, eggs uh, for eggs to fall off the nest or for some chick to fall out of the nest or some injured birds. So whenever you cruise or walk close to the bird cliffs in the Arctic, do keep an eye for Arctic fox as well. This is quite common sight with regard to wildlife. This is um, also another photo of terrain. It's a tundra vegetation. And later in the presentation, we'll go into Antarctic and you will find the stark notice between these two areas. And I always do get question, uh, which one should I go to, Arctic or Antarctica? Which one is more memorable? Which one would you recommend? Uh, it's very difficult to answer the question. It's a tricky one. And I'll answer literally as to the best of my ability. Uh, but honestly, um, Antarctica has a greater impact, immediate impact to all your senses uh, with a pure grandeur and majesty and scale of those mountains, of the glaciers, of icebergs. Everything is just so huge and tremendous that you feel so tiny and insignificant. And the colors, it's all either white or black uh, or any possible shade of blue because of the ice and snow and rocks. But what Antarctica lacks to the quite large degree is a vegetation, is a variety of vegetation. There is literally a few basic um, grasses, very basic grasses. Otherwise, it's patches of moss and lichen, but that's it. When in Arctic, you have incredible tundra vegetation, actually beautiful blooming, uh, blooming fields of um, Arctic flowers. Um, and with, with regard to wildlife, there is just more diversity. So um, I like both areas, uh, to be honest. As I said, Antarctica has a massive immediate impact to all your senses. And I've never seen anyone who coming back from Antarctica regretting or saying that it's been disappointing because it just blows away your mind. Arctic is a little bit more gentle, subtle beauty but it's more diverse. There is more colors. There is more species of wildlife and bird life. Um, and plus, uh, there is a cultural aspect and humanist aspect as well. So um, here is another photo of the landing in Svalbard. As you see, there is a glacier in the background. Uh, I said earlier that we walk you in a small groups, again, in Arctic and Antarctica. But also, it is important for us and for you to make sure that you have a moment to step aside from the group and just stay by yourself or with your partner and, and reflect in peace and quiet what you actually see around and a little bit absorb and get a feel of, um, of, the, of the area without constantly listening to interpretation and being spoken to. So when you're in these areas, please do make sure just gently to step away from the group and spend a minute or two meditating and absorbing the um, incredible uh, scenery around you. A lot of history uh, in the Arctic in the previous centuries, there is a lot of uh, trapping, um, uh, mostly Arctic fox and reindeer. There was whaling, a lot of whaling history as well. Um, none of this happening these days anymore uh, in Svalbard, but there's a lot of remains of trappers hut. And we always have a historian to bring the history to life and explain what it actually is like glaciers and zodiac cruises um, both in arctic and antarctica and galapagos a lot of exploration will be done by zodiac zodiac is inflatable power boat that you see in front of you on this photo uh, we have two types the smaller one takes around 10 people the la larger one is about 14 people but sometimes the terrain does not allow us really to uh, do long walks and in the zodiacs in these boats we can cover much greater distances than on foot. Um, and almost every day, one of your activity will be actual Zodiac cruise, where you sit in a Zodiac for an hour, hour and a half with a naturalist or lecturer driving uh, along the uh, bird cliffs or shoreline or glacier around uh, icebergs and listening to interpretation and enjoying the scenery. So that's Zodiac cruising. And the duration is generally depends on the weather condition. Ice cruising, none of our ships are ice breakers. We do not break ice. We do not go to the North Pole going, smashing about uh, up and down, up and down. 
uh, for days and days, but we are very good at sailing through brush ice and, and even cracking very uh, thin ice. So our ships are refurbished for to sail through ice like on this voyage. And uh, that experience on itself um, and in Arctic and in Antarctica is just being out there on deck at the front at the bow and look how the vessel pushes the ice flows apart. Quite spectacular. And there's quite often there wildlife on the ice that you can find. Here we go. Expedition team. I mentioned expedition team already. Um, we invest a lot of time and efforts and finances to a find the best possible expedition team, lecturers and naturalists, and as well as their training and development. As we speak, we start another round of Arctic pre-seasonal training for our staff of Silver Cloud and Silver Wind that spend a few days in Reykjavik going through uh, procedures, rifle handling, um, AECO guidelines, AECO's organization uh, that protects um, our impact, how, how to say that manages our impact uh, on the on the Arctic region. And so we work um, heavily with our staff to make sure that they not only can interpret in the field, but they also know all the rules and regulations with regards to guiding and, and operations in polar bear territory. So this is a photo literally from two weeks ago from our first pre-seasonal training. Remember Svalbard as well as some other parts of Arctic is a polar bear territory. So uh, on every voyage, you will have a bear team, bear monitors and rifle handlers to make sure that not only you are protected from polar bear attack, but that we never actually get in a situation where we may need to shoot a polar bear. Therefore, the team is highly trained on how to scout the area, that uh, how to set up the perimeter, how to make sure that before we bring you, our guests ashore, there are no polar bear around. Remember, you will never ever see polar bear on land while being on land yourself. So all the sightings are done either from the vessel or from the Zodiac. We'll never ever put you on land, even if there's a polar bear spotted somewhere in the vicinity. So we take this safety very, very seriously. Not, not only your safety, but safety of polar bear, which, as I mentioned, we do not want to put in danger. So this um, our pre-seasonal training. Uh, and these are first images that came from Silver Endeavor literally last week. They uh, were the first vessel to start a uh, Svalbard season. They were incredibly lucky. Again, a uh, disclaimer, this is a safari. This is constant search for wildlife. Some voyages are more successful, some, some of them not, to find wildlife. Uh, Silver Endeavor we, team were incredibly lucky. Within the first 24 or 48 hours, they saw seven polar bears, mothers and calves and, um, and males. So. Um, as you can see, they saw walrus, they saw reindeer, beautiful eyes right there. They saw Arctic fox, they saw seals. So our we started Swalbard this year on a very high note. So fingers crossed that um, our luck will continue as we have three vessels operating in Arctic this year and two vessels operating uh, in the Arctic next season. So there are some voyages for those of you who would like to visit to Swalbard again. I remind you, this is not a cultural destination. This is a pure wildlife and nature expedition. So there is, um, for a pure Svalbard, you need to um, get yourself on Tromsø to Longyearbyen or Longyearbyen to Tromsø voyage. That's uh, June, July next year, so Silver Wind. And if you would like a little bit of combination of and more diversity, for example, all the nature of Svalbard and plus some cultural aspect of Iceland, then you can get on a, on a voyages that combine Svalbard and Iceland. Talking about Iceland, uh, many of you probably have been to Iceland. It's also quite easy to get to. Iceland is famous for its uh, geothermal activity, for geology, for incredible waterfalls, right, for a thermal lakes that we will take you, of course, to for a geothermal fields. Um, it's a very active uh, place with regard to geothermal activities. You know, there's constantly eruptions, not constantly, but there are often eruptions happening. Um, so um, scenery, geology, 
um, waterfalls and geothermal fields is one of the big attractions. Also, the birds and some of the remote places that we visit. And uh, when we are uh, in Iceland, we visit Vigur Island every season. Why it is so special? To me, first of all, it's one of the bird sanctuaries. It's one of the best places in uh, in Iceland to enjoy Atlantic puffins, plus multiple other birds. But also, it is very special for us because, as of recently, it's owned by Felicity Aston, that you Brits may know very well, because um, she's she's from UK. Um, Felicity Aston is quite famous explorer, modern explorer. She is the lady who first, who became a first female to cross Antarctic continent solo and unsupported. Uh, there are a few books that I highly recommend, Alone in Antarctica. I read it already a few times. It's truly inspiring, magnificent, sto magnificent story, how what a human being is capable of. Uh, that story of Felicity's um, travel across um, Antarctic continent uh, on her own. And the other one is called Call of, Call of the White. So, and when we're in Vigor Island and when Felicity is there, she of course meets our guests and um, uh, staff. Uh, on this photo also, again, taken only last month, she's, our, she's there with Captain Ulf Petter. Uh, meeting our captain. So it's always a privilege for us to visit Vigor Island and meet Felicity. And um, she's also a good mother of Silver Endeavor, our latest addition to Expedition Fleet. So very special place for us and a very special person to have this relationship. With. And of course, uh, um, Iceland already quite, it's a populated place. It's a very civilized place. There's a lot of history, a lot of Viking history. And we always would have um, archaeologists and anthropologists to cover the history and Viking history in particular, as well as visit some of the sites and you'll see the performances as well. So maybe that's an option if some of you would like to combine pure nature and this polar safari of search for polar bear and walrus and other animals, plus a bit of geothermal activity and a cultural aspect um, of Iceland, that's maybe a good option. And we have quite a few voyages that combine both on Silver Endeavor and Silver Wind in 2014. Greenland, moving further into Greenland. Now, Greenland, again, it is not a wildlife destination. There is an eastern side of Greenland, maybe one or two voyages where we have a chance to see polar bear, where we have a chance to see musk ox and reindeer and um, Arctic fox. Uh, we have one or two voyages in 2014. It's uh, eastern and northeast uh, Greenland. Otherwise, southern, most of the voyages, most of the companies and us operate mostly in southern and on the western side of Greenland, which is fantastic, fantastic destination for those of you who love hiking and kayaking among the most magnificent scenery. Again, there is not so much wildlife, right? As you, as we sail uh, from port to port, from stop to stop, of course, we always have a chance to encounter some whales. <clears throat> uh, um, on land, we can see some reindeer probably, but but this is not a wildlife destination. So uh, why do we go for Greenland? We, we go for an incredible nature for the most stunning uh, terrain of mountains and fjords and again tundra vegetation we offer hikes practically every day and kayaking in these fjords uh, in Lulisat um, probably all of you heard of uh, Yakutham glacier next to Lulisat one of the most productive glaciers if not most productive glacier in the world where that is constantly carving and carving and dispatching the icebergs um, into the ocean. Uh, there is a belief or theory, it hasn't been probably proven that the icebergs that sunk Titanic carved from this particular Yakutown glacier near Ilulisat. So it's an amazing uh, place, um, Ilulisat and, and the fjords around the Ilulisat, Ilulisat to see the most amazing glaciers and the uh, icebergs. Some kayaking, whenever we can, we drop kayaks. It's not only in Greenland, and not only in Greenland, anywhere we go, 
if the weather permits, wind, swell, um, we do drop kayaks and offer kayaking to our guests alongside the nature walks and hikes and Zodiac cruises. But also what Greenland adds, Greenland adds some indigenous population, some um, Inuit culture. So on every itinerary in Greenland, besides the uh, beautiful hikes and, and kayak in a beautiful terrain, we will make sure to include cultural aspect and visit Greenlandic Inuit communities and listen to the little uh, to the local singing and dancing and throat singing. If any of you interested in throat singing, it's quite impressive. Uh, but also visiting local schools sometimes depends on the, uh, on the port. But making sure that you have a touch and a bit of understanding and a contact with the local Greenlandic culture beautiful souvenirs as well. And of course, Greenland, just like in Iceland, a lot of Viking history. So we'll visit some sites um, of uh, Norse and, and Viking sites uh, with our anthropologists and archaeologists doing interpretation. And moving on further, and that's already towards uh, late August, beginning of September. Uh, Aurora Borealis, when we start seeing the polar night, Aurora Borealis uh, or Northern Lights, um, you have quite a good chance to see that. And then further on to um, Northern Canada, um, again, Northern Canada and Nunavut area in particular, that's a good area to go see polar bears again. Places like Akpatok Island and Lower Savage Island, they provide a very high chance of encounter with polar bears. Again, we'll start seeing walrus, we'll start seeing reindeer and Arctic fox, but at the same time, in combination with Canadian Inuit culture. So the other great destination to combine a wildlife and a local culture. And for the more adventurous, I recommend Northwest Passage. It's a massive tick in your uh, travel journal um, Northwest Passage, fam famous Northwest Passage, was first uh, navigated by um, Amundsen a few centuries ago. And luckily, as well, luckily for us, not so lucky maybe for climate, uh, it is getting easier and easier to navigate every year. It is a 24-day journey through all about through northern Canada and high Canadian Arctic. There are a few Inuit communities. There is a numerous wildlife that you will see, especially at the beginning of the trip, uh, polar bear and walrus. If you're very lucky, narwhal as well, uh, birds. But otherwise, it's a lot of scenery and a lot of history. Um, so many attempts were made. Uh, this is on Beachy Island, one of the remains of um, Franklin Expedition. Uh, there are so many attempts remain to navigate this passage. There are so many historical sites. And on these voyages, we always have historian to interpret uh, and bring the history alive. Sometimes on a uh, more icy and colder years, we even have to engage icebreaker to help us through Northwest Passage. That's uh, adds another element. So that's the Arctic in a nutshell. Uh, it's a huge territory. I'm not going to spend so much time on Antarctic. There's less diversity in Antarctica uh, with regards to and culture and, uh, and terrain. Um, Antarctic, as I mentioned, is a literally impact to all your senses. This on this photo is me and my uh, now eight-year-old son Luke, already <clears throat> at base Brown or Almirante Brown on um, uh, Argentinian uh, station, and um, he was five, I think, at that stage. That's the earliest that you can put your kid in a zodiac remember five years old um, there's no point to bring anyone younger than that they won't be able to leave the vessel but five years onwards welcome to antarctica a uh, little luke has been there already three times uh he's eight <laughs> so every year i have to go for work he joins me and we have a great time exploring the continent antarctica is spectacular antarctica everywhere you go there are high mountains, there is massive, massive glaciers, some of them calving uh, more actively, some calving less actively. And we get guests ashore practically every day. We need to, we make sure that we also land guests on an Antarctic continent and not only on surrounding islands. 
Um, kayaking, hiking, there is no really, almost no long distance hiking because terrain does not allow, it's too rugged terrain in Antarctica. There is a, <clears throat> literally a couple of places in South Georgia, but that's really it. But otherwise it's landing uh, um, at the research station, it's landing for a short nature walks, it's um, Zodiac cruises every day, exploratory, looking for wildlife, uh, mostly seals, about five species of seals, whales. And no matter where you go in Antarctica, you will encounter penguins. There is no way, uh, like on this image, there is no way you go to Antarctica and not see penguins. About, depends on itinerary, you're likely to see about five species. Um, you'll be lucky not to see penguin every day. There is, they just everywhere. <laughs> they just everywhere you go. They're absolutely cute and charming. You see them in the water, uh, fishing for creel, for fish. Uh, you see them at the rookery sitting on their nest eggs. Depends on the time of the year you go, you'll see the <clears throat> young chicks. My favorite time probably to go at the very beginning of the season, uh, mid November until mid-December, where everything is covered with ice and snow. Penguins just arrived, and um, um, they still lay in eggs, sitting on eggs. Uh, it's just so clean, so pristine. There is Everything is just white and blue and with a little of patches of brown with, on exposed rock. But it's for me because I've been there, um, I don't know, 30 plus times. I have seen enough chicks. If you want to see wildlife and bird life in a prime top numbers, probably mid-December and December, the whole month of January, beginning of February, that will be your best uh, time. Uh, the chicks starting to appear mid-December towards Christmas and onwards. Um, here we go. And every day we're in Zodiacs. There is no ports. There is no jetties that we can use. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 no piers, I mean. Uh, every day you will be in Zodiacs, landing, Zodiac cruising, and exploring fantastic Antarctic continent. Here we go. In most incredible iceberg formations. Um, as you can see, it's always worth to be in just out on deck and enjoying the beauty and looking for those seals and whales and penguins. And of course, when you get a little bit cold, because it does get a bit chilly in Antarctica, as you can imagine, you can always come inside and warm up with a hot tea or hot chocolate. Now, going to Antarctica, if you have time, and if it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, I do recommend to do a voyage, to longer voyage that includes Falkland Islands and South Georgia, because your diversity of what you see will triple, quadruple, and you probably will, be, uh, will visit the most incredible place in the world that actually belongs to British Crown. It's called South Georgia uh, in the South Pacific. So I'll show some images of South, South Georgia. You see the very rugged terrain. There's a bit more greenery because it's sub-Antarctic. It's not Antarctic, it's sub-Antarctic. There's a lot of tussock grass and uh, other gra grasses. But one of the bigger, big attractives are the massive colonies of king penguins. We're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of king penguins at the landing sites. So this is South St. Andrews Bay, one of the most spectacular uh, landings in South Georgia. Um, you see there are some greenery, there's some tussock grass. Be besides penguins, there's also seals, fur seals all around, elephant seals, uh, albatrosses soaring above. It's most incredible. I, uh, I've been traveling for the last um, 15 years um, just on expedition all over the world. And I cannot think of place that blows away your mind with regard to diversity and your encounters with wildlife than South Georgia. You can get very close to the elephant seals, to the fur seals, to the penguins, um, alba nesting albatrosses and all of this, of course, produce a lot of sound, produces a lot of smell as well. And quite often our challenge to land in South Georgia, not only the swell and surf at the beach, but just the amount of wildlife on the beach. We have to kind of find a spot where we uh, would do less disturbance because the beaches are just so packed with wildlife. 
incredible, incredible. If you have once in a lifetime opportunity to go to Antarctica and you have time for a longer voyage, please do the ones that includes Falkland Islands, which will be very interesting to you, um, British guests as well, and South Georgia. A lot of history, of course. Um, those of you who read Shackleton's Endurance, you know that uh, in South Georgia, where he's actually buried, um, uh, we visit his grave uh, in Gritwikin. We do a toast for Aaron Shackleton, his memory. And um, our historian, of course, gives a speech. So do consider trip to Antarctica. As of last few years, we not just sail through direct passage to Antarctica and back. We also offer fly cruises. For those of you who, for one reason or the other, do not want to sail to Antarctica, or maybe you want to save a day or two of your travel, we do have fly cruises as well. Uh, all you need to uh, do is get yourself to Santiago, Chile, and there's a charter flight to uh, Punta Arenas, the overnight in Punta Arenas. Then on a, another charter flight, you fly to King George Island, which is already in Antarctica, where you embark our silver endeavor. So there are so many ways to get to Antarctica, sailing, fly cruises. There are so many itineraries from six days only on a fly cruise to Antarctic Peninsula to 18 days of, that includes uh, 16 to 18 days, that includes Falkland, uh, South Georgia and Antarctic Peninsula. But also there are 12 days itinerary, 14 days itinerary. So have a look, there's so much variety and we have three vessels um, in Antarctica this coming season, 23-24. And the last one, I'm running over time, but the other, uh, and I know we, we speak about wildlife because that's that's one of the biggest draw of expedition cruising is, uh, is a wildlife, search for wildlife in the wild and diversity and uniqueness of the wildlife and endemic species. There is other absolute amazing place where I've been with, with my family just um, this January over uh, over New Year's um, is um, Galapagos on silver origin. Um, I'm sure you all heard of Galapagos. Galapagos is fantastic destination again to look for wildlife, not for culture, um, but for the wildlife, endemic wildlife. And wildlife that endemic means that it cannot be found anywhere else, for those of you who don't know. Um, but also wildlife that does not afraid of human beings. So you can walk right past nesting blue-footed booby, like on this photo by marine iguanas, right by land iguanas, uh, right by nesting uh, waved albatrosses, and they will not rush away from you. So there are only two places in the world that um, I have seen that uh, phenomena where wildlife do not react on humans pretty much at all, is a Galapagos and B, South Georgia, which is I just presented. So all these penguins and, and the uh, elephant seals and fur seals and albatrosses, they actually are not afraid of humans. So you can walk right past them obviously keeping usually with it we, we keep six feet uh, distance because you still don't want to intrude uh but this is a unique destination absolutely we have two itineraries um this is a um frigate bird a magnificent frigate bird uh flightless cormorants um this is a waved albatross the <laughs> The beauty of Galapagos Islands is that you go, can go there year round. It's not a seasonal destination. There are two seasons, um, main season. So there is a, a dry and colder season uh, from uh, May until November, where there's hardly any rain. It's the way um, air is cooler. Um, it's more pleasant for walks, right? <clears throat> but it comes with a water being cooler as well some of my friends that travel to galapagos were actually shocked how cold water can be <laughs> it can go um, in some places it can go down to 15 16 degrees centigrade so that's why we provide uh, wetsuits on board right but that cold water actually enabled the extraordinary amount of species to flourish there in the cold water because of cold water is always more nutrient rich than warm water that's why there's Galapagos penguins living at the equator because of these cold currents that wash 
uh, Galapagos archipelago. There are um, this is this is a Galapagos penguins. Here we go, little guys. And what is most amazing about Galapagos is um, and uh, what my son really appreciated, an eight-year-old um, who is very keen snorkeler, that you snorkel almost every day. But when you snorkel, when you're in the water, besides fish and some coral, um, you also see at the same time penguins, uh, green turtles, um, the um, marine iguanas, uh, sea lions. Of course, not at every site you see all of them in the water, but it's quite amazing to be in the water and snorkel and snorkel with penguins, snorkel with sea lions, snorkel with turtles. The abundance and the proximity that you can get to these animals is just absolutely tremendous. Uh, we were blown away. And of course, Silver Origin is our new vessel, um, what, three, four years old only. Um, we launched her during COVID. The food is spectacular. The expedition staff is phenomenal. Remember, all expedition staff that guide you in Galapagos have to, it's not an option, they have to be Ecuadorian or Galapagenos, but they also have to specifically train by Galapagos National Park in order to guide there. So we cannot question their knowledge. Their knowledge is tremendous. And the way they interpret and the way they know practically every rock of the area is quite fascinating. So a lot to learn. And it's quite busy activity. Every day, almost twice a day, you will be either hiking or kayaking or snorkeling. And of course, you can always opt out and stay on board if you're tired. No one is forcing you, but it's quite busy activity. And as, out of everything that we do with Silver Sea, Silver Sea Cruises is probably the most family-friendly destination because kids just would love being in the water and seeing animals around them all the time every day, plus learning from the naturalists. I mentioned snorkeling already. Uh, here we go. Here's a great photo of a snorkeler with a sea lion <clears throat> and a whole lot of fishes. Um, I mentioned there are two itineraries. That's how close the penguins do get to you sometimes. Um, I mentioned there are two activities, two itineraries, Western and North Central. It does not really matter which one you do. Uh, unless you're very specific to have to see that particular bird, uh, like white albatross or that particular species, you will see you will see 95 percent of, of all of them one way or the other. Um, there are slight differences between activities, but if you're not specifically after a certain species of wildlife, as for for a lay uh, person, that not a scientist, it does not really matter so much which one to do, either Western or North Central. Both are very, very impressive, very active. Um, you can do, you can combine both of activities and spend two weeks in Galapagos without repeating a single spot. You will repeat the islands, right? But you will not repeat the actual landing site, the real spots. So even if you combine two itineraries, every day or for 14 days, you will be doing different spots, stops. And then definitely you can cover every single species that you can um, possibly hope to see in Galapagos. There are some photos from the terrain. As you see, <clears throat> sometimes it's a beautiful flat beaches. This is uh, sometimes it's a little bit more rocky and more strenuous walks, uh, but generally it's quite easy walking very often um, either it's either beach or the uh, lava flow. Well, I... Um, Thank you so much um, for allowing me to present these three destinations um, to go into great detail on every Arctic, this part of Arctic, Antarctic or Galapagos. It will probably take us a week. So I hope this very brief, very broad overview um, will help you at least a little bit to decide where you want to go next. And then if you want to have questions, now it's time for questions. <clears throat> but otherwise, Alex is always there. Uh, as well as the Nutella and Silver Seas team to help you to find out every single little detail that possibly still stops you from booking that Silver Sea voyage. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Sorry, Alex. I always find that sometimes no questions is great because it means that you've covered everything and you're really, really <laughs> clear. So, but yeah, if anybody has questions, please um, do put them in the chat box on the uh, bottom of your screen and we're in hand. If not, Alex and the team will follow up, actually. Yes, we've, we, so the team here at Monday have had the pleasure of traveling um, to Antarctica, the Arctic and Galapagos, actually with Silver Sea, uh, in fact. So uh, we've experienced the um, we've experienced the product firsthand, and we are available to talk through uh, any and all questions that you may have. Um, we will be following up post this presentation with a recording, should you wish to watch it back, or send it on to friends or family. And we will also be sending on uh, details of Silver Sea's latest offers um, for their expedition products, which have some fantastic value savings available for you. So, um, so we will do that. That will come through to you tomorrow. And yeah, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. It's been uh, it's been fantastic to hear about such fantastic trips. And yeah, thank you very much to Daniil for for presenting that fantastic presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye now.